Welcome to this week's Sava School podcast. I'm Leah Hodge and today I have with me a good friend and colleague, Robbie Morgan. Welcome, Robbie. G'day, g'day. How are we? Thanks for joining us today. So we're in um, lesson number four of the, the, the quarterly. It's on the Everlasting Covenant. And before we get into it, we're going to start a word with prayer. So Robbie, could you pray for us? Father in heaven, we just thank you for the privilege that we have to have access to your word and to your spirit who inspired that word. And we pray that you would be with each of us as we listen and think and talk about these things that you would inspire us and that you would lead us in the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to start off on Sunday's lesson here, and it's entitled Yahweh and the Abrahamic Covenant, and it starts with Genesis 15, verse 7. Could you read that for us, Robbie? Yes, I can. So Genesis 15, verse 7, this is the New King James Version, and it says, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And... The lesson brings out that the word Lord here, which is translated, you know, Lord in my Bible as well, is actually the word Yahweh, yeah. how we pronounce it. Not sure exactly how you pronounce that word, but what is... It's what, okay, nobody actually is. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. So this word Yahweh has significant meaning. What does this, what is the word Lord or Yahweh, like what's the root word of this? What was the significant about him introducing himself to Abraham as Yahweh? Well, there's lots of things that you could say about that, I suppose. Um, and I'm no expert on this. I'm no Hebrew expert. But one of the things that sticks out to me, and this isn't necessarily what the, the lesson uh, brings out, but it's interesting because when you read the first chapter of Genesis, it calls God by the name Elohim, the plural God name. And then in Genesis chapter 2, it introduces God as Yahweh Elohim, if I remember correctly. And that's when the story gets really personal. God gets down on his hands and knees and his, his, his fingers in the dirt to start shaping mankind. So it's this personal name. Mm. Um, it it kind of denotes the personal aspect of God. And it's super interesting what it said in the lesson as well, talking about how it, it may have come from, I forget what the word was, maybe you've got it there in the notes, but the, the Hebrew word for to be or the state of being, in other words, I am. Yes, the self-existent one. It's like it, eternal, always there, didn't have a beginning. No end. Yeah. And I love this because if you think about this, when, when God introduces himself to Moses in the burning bush, he uses that same description. Who, who will I tell has told me to come and speak to the Israelites? Who am I going to say sent me? And he says, tell them that I am yep. has sent you. I am who I am. And Jesus in John chapter 8, I think it is, 858 around there, yep. he says, before Abraham was, I tell you truly, I am. Yeah, drop that bombshell. That's right. Which they knew what that meant. Oh, they, fully. They had full significance of what it, what the you know I am that I am. It's it's amazing. So he he comes to Abraham and introduces himself as the self existent one, this personal God as well. Mm. How do you think? Like, why do you think he said uses this term to Abraham at oh, this time? This is a great question. One of the reasons that sticks out to me is that. The covenant that he's about to establish, this is not, by the way, the first time that the promise of Messiah comes. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. But this promise that he's making to Abraham is the promise. It's the fulfillment of that. Well, not maybe the fulfillment per se. Jesus is the fulfillment of it. But, but this is the continuation of that very same promise from Genesis 3. And he's now making it a covenant. He's making an agreement about how this is going to come to take place. And he says that it's going to happen through Abram's family. Mm-hmm. This is huge, right? It and is. this is the same covenant that's going to be fulfilled when Jesus returns. That's the answer to the same covenant. It's not It's not a different covenant. It's the same covenant. Yeah. And I like it how it brings out that like the Hebrews always sort of name as indicating like characteristics of someone. So it had deep significance for their culture. Um, and so, yeah, names are truly important. And as we see as we go on to the other days, this whole, the name of someone introduces like a different characteristic of them and who they are and how they represent themselves. So God here is telling Abraham, like, there is no one else like me. Exactly I am right. the most powerful being, but I'm also the most personal and most loving and I'm unconditionally able to provide for you. And yeah, I love that. It's, it gives you great confidence knowing that he's that person, that he's that God. Oh, 100%. 
I love what you were saying there too, because because God is the transcendent God. He's He's above and beyond and so far up there that there's there's no comparison, and yet He's imminent. He's near in a way that not even another person can be that near to you. That's it. So this would have given Abraham a great great confidence. It would have given Abraham great. Um, yeah, with the promise that he was just about to receive. So let's go to Genesis 17 and verse 1, which we're going over to Mondays now. And Genesis 17 verse 1, if you could read that. It says, When Abraham was, sorry, Abram, excuse me, was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, or El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. Well, wow. he comes... Um, another introduction of one of the names of God. He comes as El Shaddai. Um, and he's, it says he's 99 years old. I think that's an important part of the verse there because yeah. <laughs> he's old and he still hasn't had children. Yeah. And he's saying, but I am the almighty God, so I can handle this. Like, I'm big enough for this problem mm. and I can, you know, I'm going to be able to fulfill th- this issue. Yeah, because totally. You need supernatural help for this. You know, I love that. I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little vulnerable here, but what I love about this is, I love that God has different names that He goes by in the, in in Scripture, and these these names give different aspects of His character. Like El Shaddai, God Almighty, is mm-hmm. is is an important aspect of who God is, but it's not the only important aspect of who God is, and it doesn't paint the total picture. And a, a way to relate to this, I think, is that. You're gonna know when I. My name's Robbie, or well, my my real name is Robert. You know, so at different times in your life, you may be called different things by different people, and it draws out like it's it's kind of highlighting a little aspect of who you are. So when I was when I was little, I would get called Robbie by my by my my most of my family, my friends. My mom would sometimes, even though we're not Latin, she would use some Spanish names. She would call me Robertito, which is like little Robbie, you know, and then uh, my uncle calls me Bob Cobb of all strange things. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because what these names do, this is not a perfect illustration, but but it actually draws out certain aspects of who you are as being described in those different settings because those people are seeing different aspects of who you are. It's, and what and you revealing. need at that time in your life. That's exactly right. Yes. And so God is filling in right now. He's introducing himself by the name that is most specific and uh, applicable to Abraham's situation. Totally. It just reminds me, and I was just trying to find it in the Bible, where Hagar, um, she's told to leave um, Abraham and Sarah um, because, you know, because of this promise and everything. And she's a crying um, and then an angel appears to her. And I can't remember the name that she uses, but she it's says... Jehovah Jireh, I think. You're the right. God who sees. Like, mm. he saw what she was going through and she gave him a particular name. Mm. Um, I just love that because it just you know, perfectly illustrates the point that you were saying that God is personal and he, you know, he he has all these different names, you know, people who are struggling financially and God provides, you know, that I think that's um, the word that you were just using there, actually. You say Jehovah Jireh, isn't that the I, Lord provides? I think, that's, I think that's the right one. Yes. Anyway, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what Hagar, she, she had a name for God as well because she was going through something and she realized that God was watching what she was going through and he appeared to her and she, yeah, she really appreciated that. Yeah, fully. All right. Well, well, this is, I think what we've talked about Sunday, Monday is interesting. Um, And Tuesday it talks about another name change. And I think that that's fascinating. We'll talk about that briefly. And then we're going to get into what I think is like the meat, so to speak of the, of the lesson, the bulk of the lesson, which is actually getting into the Abrahamic covenant. What was the covenant? It came in three it's talked about in three different stages, so to speak, or at three different points. And I think that's where the, the story, like the rubber really hits the road there. And I think that's where yes. it gets really exciting. But before that, let's just carry on with this name theme. And let's go back to Genesis chapter 17. And let's read verse 4 and verse 5. Um, do you want to read that for yes. us this time, Leah? It says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Oh, I love that. I love that he that God. First of all, what what is he changing his name to? Well, he's changing his name to Abraham, which means a father of many nations. So, rather than exalted father, you're now being called the father, not just of nations, not just of some, not just exalted, mm-hmm. but of many nations. 
which is tying back into the Abrahamic promise that starts in Genesis chapter 12, which we're about to look at. Yep. But yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I just love it that it's God that changes the name. It's not like, you know, you were saying your mom and your friend, your uncle, whatever, gives you a nickname. But God, he saw this and he's like, I'm changing your name. And I think that that gives more gravity and weight to that fact. Totally. Even, even when you read about what's, what's happening in the seven churches, there's a promise in Revelation chapter 2 to 3 in one of the churches where he says, I will, I will give them a stone and it will have a name on it that no one else knows except for that person, right? Yes. Name being an, a way to identify somebody's purpose or value, not, not value, but, but purpose, their, their inherent nature, yeah. character. Their identity. That's right. Yep, love it. And I love that God's doing that. And I love that he says, I have made you. Mm. Right, he has not yet had the child of promise. He's about to be told that Ishmael is not the child of promise, and he's going to have the child of promise. And yet he says already, "I have made you." Yes, completed action. Yes, a father of many nations. That's right. So yeah, he makes the change before the thing happens. Yeah. So that's 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 interesting. God's in the business of doing things His way and His time, but it's it's Him that's doing the work. And it's so easy for us to get caught up into the, the, the little nitty gritty details because I do it all the time of I'm not there yet, but that doesn't matter because God is not the God who is con- constrained by time or constrained by the things that constrain us. He's the one who says, no, I've said it. It is done. It will be done. Yeah, it was like he was giving him more evidence to the fact that it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Like it's like, I'm actually going to change your name to show that this will happen. And it's just giving him, yeah, that extra... I, I guess, yeah, evidence of the promise. So there's another name change um, that is shown before yeah, we move on. And that's um, one that's very well known, I'm sure, by many people. And it's found in Genesis 32 um, and verse 28. And that's the story of actually one of Abraham's descendants. And that's none other than Jacob. So in Genesis 32 verse 28, it says, And he said, Your name shall be no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And so the context of this is that Jacob was, um, you know, about to, I guess he was worried or severely fearful about his brother that was coming. So he's gone to pray over the, the, the brook or the river. And then he's there wrestling with this person, which we know is Christ, with God and, and then he, he goes all night and wrestles with this man and then he doesn't, you know, let him go until, you know, God blesses him. And then we have the, the name change that he was first the deceiver, Jacob, the supplanter, the one who, you know, deceived his brother, deceived his father out of the birthright. And now he's had this change of character, this change of um, mindset. He's repented, he's forgiven, and he's changed. And God changes his name to show the fact that he's not the same man anymore. He's now prevailed with God, and he's victorious. Mm. There's an interesting correlation <laughs> that <laughs> because, well, we're going to get into it in a moment, but Jacob is also wounded permanently in that moment, mm. which would be a constant reminder. You can no longer run away from your problems, which is what Jacob's method of attack was. Oh, I messed up with Esau. He's upset. He wants to kill me. I'm going to run away from the problem. Oh, things aren't going well with Laban. I need to run away from the problem. And so what does God do? He wounds his hip so he can no longer ever again run. <laughs> That's I've never thought of that. <laughs> so God's, God's promise comes sometimes in wounding the, idol, the idols in our lives, mm. which is what's interesting there. And what we're about to talk about, the sign of the covenant as we get into it in Genesis 17 actually relates to that in a really profound way. So let's jump into Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Yes, Covenant Stages. All right, so we're going to have a look at Genesis chapter 12. So that's some cool stuff, some insightful things, but I think this is where the rubber hits the road. Definitely. This is where things really start to get very interesting. So let's read what was what was the original promise, the original covenant that starts to be laid out, the first application of it 
in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Yeah, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and curse him that curses you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I love this. So God makes a promise to Abraham. It's a command, really. Yes. He says, hey, look, point number one, get out, right? Go. And then he he doesn't say, go to a place that I have shown you. He says, go to a place that I will show you, right? Yes. Which takes a lot of faith. Um, He says, I will make you a great nation. So notice all the I wills. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, right? Mm -hmm. Who's doing all the work here? God is. God is. And what's Abram's response supposed to be? To believe. To believe. And if he believes what God is saying, then the appropriate response would be to actually act as if he believes what God is saying, and to actually go to this place that has not yet been described and see where God takes him. And that's exactly what he does. In verse 4, it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, which ties in really profoundly with what, with what Paul talks about in Romans, where he says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Yes. Right? Abram had no righteousness of his own. The righteousness that was given to him was imputed because he believed. That's right. That's that, and this is the gospel down to a very, you know, the nutshell of it. And I just want to bring out Galatians 3 verse 8. In Galatians 3, verse 8, it says, I just... um, Galatians is powerful. Paul is a really profound biblical thinker. It says here... It really ties it together. Yeah. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. So that little... That last bit there was... We just read it in Genesis 12. It's a quote. This is saying that this is the gospel preached. Yeah. This is the gospel preached unto Abraham. So the gospel hasn't changed from Genesis to Revelation. No. It's the same. It's the same gospel. It's the same. Paul God this. is making this covenant promise and we are to believe it and it is accounted to us for righteousness. So I love it how Paul makes that clear here that this was the gospel preached. Mm. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good. Now, this is the first time where this happens. What's really interesting to note is that Abram begins the journey, and I think it's, it's significant to note that the journey with God, believing in his covenant, accepting it, is exactly that. And it's such a cliche thing to say. It's a journey, right, which becomes really wishy-washy. We don't know what anybody means when they say it. But the reality is, for Abram, it was literally get out and walk to a place that God has not yet said to go, like where yes. you're going. So it was literally walking which is how Paul describes, in, particularly in the book of Ephesians, how the journey of faith is. It's a walk with God, walking in this way, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But notice that the very next part of the story, which it doesn't really talk about here in the lesson, but just for context, the very next thing that Abram does is he really messes up. He winds up in Egypt. He winds up disbelieving and distrusting in God and starting to be deceptive to try and save his own skin. And so the very first thing we see is God makes a promise God, God is saying, this is what it's going to be like. This is what I'm going to do for you. Believe and follow. He starts to believe and follow, and when the going gets tough, he winds up in a situation where he begins to trust his own, he rests That's on right. his laurels, so to speak. Because really, after <laughs> he made that promise, he, there was a famine. That's right. And he's like, so he goes to the land that God said... Um, Don't go back to Egypt, right? Yeah, and then he... It's not he, exactly the same land, but you know, but it's, like when it's God, a pagan land. Yeah, when God makes promises to us, and then we come into trial and difficulty... It's easy. We could do easily what Abram did and doubt and then try and save ourselves and try and, um, yeah, <laughs> drown in our own, yeah. We just, it's, I'm just saying like we can look at Abram and go, well, how, how could he do this? I'm like, mm, no, we can easily do the same thing. When I look at my way. life and I look at Abram's life, I'm encouraged. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we come to chapter 15, we come into the second you know, the second stage of the covenant, so to speak, where God announces the covenant in more detail. So let's go to uh, Genesis 15. And oh, where are we going to read from? There's so much that I we know. can read. Dun, dun, dun. Um, let's do a little, just keeping an eye on the time here. So Genesis chapter 15, God appears to Abram in a vision. 
And notice what he says in verse 1. He says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, homeboy's thinking, you know, a- Abram's thinking here, I, I, where, where's my reward? You promised me a nation. You promised that you would have all these things. I've just gone to battle, and I could be attacked by these mm-hmm. people. And he says, I'm your shield. I'm your protection, but I'm also your reward. And then Abram says in verse 2, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And then Abram's like, look, I don't have any offspring. How am I supposed to have anybody who's going to be a nation for me like you promised? And then in verse 4, God responds back. He says, no, no, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. He takes him outside and he says, look, at, look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. So shall your descendants mm. be. And notice in verse 6, it says, He believed the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. A repetition of that same, that same fact. So he believes. It's a massive thing here for him to believe. Like for you to be taken out to see the stars. Yeah. Have you ever looked up into the night sky and seen the stars? Yeah. And for him to believe. Out in the desert where there's no pollution, right? Yeah, like, where that this is going to happen. Um, you can see how the faith, like his his faith was great at this point in time to believe that even though he had no child yet. Yeah. Now check this out. I think this is really important to note. Sometimes I think when we talk about faith, we, we confuse honest questions with rebellious doubt. And it's very easy to get those two things confused. Because notice the very next thing that happens in the story. Verse 6, he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And then in verse 7, then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the, Chal- of, the, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And what's the very next thing say in verse 8? Abram says, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And I think this is important. He's just told him, you're going to have descendants. He says, I believe. And then he says, you're going to inherit this land. And then he's got questions again. And questions are not necessarily problematic. God's not, I don't believe that God is in a position where he says, you're not allowed to ask questions. You're not allowed to journey with me and to learn and to grow. But notice that the question here wasn't a doubtful question. He wasn't, he wasn't saying it to cast doubt. He was actually just, I just don't see it. I don't understand. How is it going to happen? I believe you can, you can do it, but help me to understand. I think that's a really important thing for us to just keep in the back of our mind. Cause sometimes when we ask questions, we struggle, we think, oh, there's something inherently wrong with me and I could never make it through this. But that's not necessarily the case. No. And if you look at the Psalms, you know, David, he was constantly, and others were constantly asking questions to God. And I like God, yeah, it's he's not intimidated by our questions. He's He wants us to be honest with him as well. And like you said, with this one here, it's not like he's unbelieving. He's just, yeah, it's just a great promise. Like, how is this going to happen? Like, how do I know, Lord? And God's happy to give him more evidence. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it, it's, he's happy to do it. It's lovely. So what happens here? So God then puts him into it, like, he, he, he says the sun goes down, a deep sleep falls upon Abram. He tells him before this, I, w- I want you to do something. And for sake of time, we might not read the whole thing. But he says, I want you to take a heifer and this other animal, this other animal, a couple of birds, split all the large animals in half, lay them next to their other halves, put the birds next to each other, and then he just waits. What in the world is going on here? Is this a familiar thing? Well, it is for him because this was <laughs> actually um, a familiar ceremony for the people of that time in the way that they made agreements. Yeah. Um, so for us, it's pretty bizarre to yeah. do this. It's quite like, I was like, what? is going on but it is actually what they the, the oriental custom of making an, a, a compact and agreement with someone so god was coming to him and meeting him on his understanding and on his grounds here by coming mm. down and condescending to do this ceremony of this contract this covenant that he's just about to do it like with these you know slaying of the animals and um yeah this is how they did it back then that's right and what would happen in this blood covenant is that the parties would then walk through between the animals And what that was symbolizing was if I fail to meet my end of this bargain, if I fail to uphold my end of the covenant, so be done to me as it was done to these animals. In other words, God is saying, we're going to make an agreement here, an agreement that I'm swearing my life to, which is huge. Massive. And then what's amazing is he falls asleep. God makes a promise to him. He gives him this prophecy. He says, hey, look, 
for the next 400 years, you know, you're going to have descendants. They're going to go to a land that's not their own. They're going to be slaves. Then they're going to be brought back here in the fourth generation, et cetera, et cetera. And then after that, in verse 17, it says, And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying the promise about receiving descendants who would receive that land. And what I think is incredibly profound here is who walks through first? God does. God does. And you might be asking, well, what do you mean? There's an oven and there was a torch. Well, what's interesting to note is a smoking oven and a burning torch sounds very, very similar to the appearance of the angel of the Lord, who is Jesus. When the Israelites were coming out of Egypt and the pillar of cloud came down or the pillar of smoke and led them and at night a pillar of fire. And so what we have here is we actually have the angel of the Lord literally passing through this physically Mm. to demonstrate the covenant that my life is on the line to keep this covenant to you. And the, the, the significance of that cannot be understated. Jesus is swearing to give his life to keep his end of the covenant. And if he that's does what's that. Necessary. And he does that. And he does it. Isn't it amazing? Well, wow, is is your mind blown, guys? Because it's mine <laughs> is, like just the fact of the way that God makes this covenant with Abraham, and how He makes it so, like certain, so, I don't know, concrete that you know I'm going to do exactly what I said I'm going to do. Believe it, Abraham, and he comes down and he makes this agreement in this type of way. Uh, it's just amazing. Praise it's totally God. Amazing. Amen. Now, before we finish up, because we got like one day left and I'm looking at the time, we've probably got five minutes left. Um, the very next chapter is, is not good news, right? And if you think about, you, you got to kind of keep the time frame in. Chapter 12, Abraham's, or Abram, rather, before his name is changed, is 75 years old. It doesn't tell us how old he is in chapter 15. It doesn't say how much time has passed exactly. But in chapter 16, it tells us that he's about 85 years old. So we're talking, it could have been up to 10 years where we hear nothing. And who knows, maybe Abram heard nothing. And maybe this is why he's beginning to question. 10 years he's been waiting for a child. As a 75-year-old man with a 65-year-old wife who's uh, barren, right? And then later on it says she's past the age of childbearing. I'm I'm taking that to mean she's post-menopausal, right? So... (laughs) All of a sudden, everything's starting to look pretty dire. And the situation comes about where his wife, Sarai, suggests, hey, take, take my maidservant, impregnate her. She'll bear her, her child on my knees, which is a custom of the day, to say, well, this will, child will be my child. And so they go about doing that, has the child, etc. Mm. And then we come to Genesis 17. And perhaps Abram has, is doing the very same thing in this story as we so often do, which is we say, man, God's going to do what God promised. And then we don't see him doing it the way we expect. So we go about trying to fulfill it our own way, which is actually not in accordance with his ways. That's right. And that's exactly what Abram does. And it's really unbelief. It's exactly it's total that. unbelief. And so that he's not having that, you know, he believed in the Lord and it was accounting of righteousness. He was doing it in his own way. And um, because he couldn't see any other way. So he t- the works of the flesh here we see coming forward, if you want to use it in theological terms. Um, yeah, we have got here. Um, then we've got the circumcision that comes because of this fact. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Have you ever wondered why circumcision was the sign of the covenant? Well, it's right here. That's it. Look. The, the truth is, and we don't, we don't want to be graphic or anything, but the reality is the very thing that Abram had used to try and bring about God's promise by his own work was the very thing that God said, hey, hang on a second. I'm going to give you a son. And he's, Abram's probably like, well, yeah, here he is. Look, there he is, Ishmael. That's exactly what the conversation looks like. He says, no, but here's, here's the sign of my covenant. The thing that you used against my will in disobedience and in, in lack of faith to bring about my promise by your work. I want you to wound that. Not just you, but your perpetual generations are going to wound that as a reminder so that every time you see yourself, you can be reminded it is not you and your work that achieves what God is going to achieve. It's God who's going to achieve what he's going to achieve in you. It's not your work. It's his work. That's right. 
the, the flesh cannot do this. Mm. It has to be God doing it. That's right. And so you need to cut that thing off and you've got to let God work. That's right. Yep. Which ties back into Jacob, as we mentioned earlier. He's wounding the very thing that, he was, that, that the person was using as an idol to achieve God's purpose in their own way, to avoid trusting in God and letting God do it his way. And so he wounds that. Yeah, it would have very deep significance for, you know, for um, Jacob and for Abraham to have this right of circumcision. Um, we, we in our today's society, we find that very strange, but not back then. It would have been very like, okay, I realized that I, um, I took things into my own hands and God is revealing to me. Now you have to fully trust me even more, I believe, because he's injured the thing that he's got to use to have Isaac. That's right. So he's got to have even more like of that trust that God will do it. And this is not like sterile, in, you know, sanitarium That's kind right. of situation. It's not Sydney Adventist Hospital under anesthetic, you know. That's true. This is with a, a, a sharpened rock in a dirty desert where infection risk is high. That's right. He's literally putting his life on the line. That's a good point. Yeah. So hectic stuff, man. Hectic stuff. And I, I guess we should finish probably with this thought. And that's that circumcision had a time and a place. We see that in the... In the in the New Testament writings of Paul, we see circumcision is no longer necessary as a covenant sign of being a part of God's people. But we also see that he, ref- well, sorry, the, and, but he refers yet to a circumcision of the heart, right? Mm. An internal, a spiritual circumcision, not a physical outward thing that you can fake it, right? You can fake it and pretend and have all the right stuff done on the outside, but your heart can still be in the wrong space. He says true circumcision is of the heart. A Jew is one who is a Jew inwardly, Right? So this circumcision of the heart is what's necessary. We need to be willing to allow God to humble us internally, to trust him with our heart about everything, to trust that he's going to do the work and to hear, to believe, and by his grace to obey. Amen. Just on the last, um, on the last day, just in closing, it says that there is um, a covenant obligation which it talks about Abram or Abraham um, that God knew him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and that they will keep the way of the Lord. Um, and I think that just with what you said there, like we need to trust in God and obey Him, just like Abraham did. And that comes with that full, full, total surrender, because we want God to look on us just like He did to Abraham and said, "I know, Robbie." that he's going to, you know, follow me. He's going to um, lead his family um, in my ways. And that's the covenant. It comes with our response to God. Mm. It's not just, you know, God makes a promise and he's going to do everything through us if we believe and if we surrender and fully trust in him that no matter what the circumstances look like, like Abraham, he was old, he's cut off some flesh, you know, he, Sarah is old. But God said, I will do it. And we need to come to that point. No matter what's going on in our life, we believe in God because his word says so. And he said, I am El Shaddai. I am the God Almighty. And also, I am Yahweh, the self-existent one. I can handle your problems. That's right. I can handle, you know, all your sins, everything. So we hope you had, um, you know, enjoyed our Sabbath School podcast today and that your Sabbath School on, um, when you teach it this Sabbath, it will be a blessing to those who are in your class. So we'll just... Close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the covenant that you have given to us. I pray that you'll help us to believe in it, that we will fully trust what you've said, that you will fulfill it. And so, Lord, we pray that we will strengthen our faith, that we will walk with you no matter what challenges are facing us. And we know, Lord, that you are the almighty God and that you will never let us down. And so we pray that you'll help us to fully believe in you, just like Abraham did. In Jesus' name, amen.